Hey guys, in this episode we're going to take a look at one of the first guitars I've ever built. It's kind of a shit show of poor craftsmanship and poor design choices, all sort of smashed together into one pretty ugly, though functional, guitar. So I'll point out all the flaws and talk a little bit about what can be done to avoid making these mistakes in the first place. By the way, when I talk about mistakes, I like to break mistakes down into two categories. There are errors of design and errors of execution. Errors of design are things like overbracing, awkward pairings of wood choices or other design elements, too much ornamentation or too little ornamentation, or maybe sporadic ornamentation that's inconsistent with the guitar as a whole. Basically, these are the choices we make independent of the technique or lack of technique that we use to execute these choices. Execution errors are things like bad miters, gaps in joinery, tear out, visible sanding scratches, or really anything that can be resolved by finding a better technique or simply by practicing more. All right, so let's take a look at this guitar. Going through this guitar honestly kind of pains me a little bit because there's a lot of awkward things here to look at that at the time, honestly, when I built this, I was very proud of it. And I think as you go through the process of building guitars, iteration after iteration, one after the other, it's okay to, you should be proud of what you're doing. But as time goes on, you should also be able to look back at what you're doing and honestly feel a little embarrassed. And so that's what we're going to do right now. I think doing, performing sort of a post-mortem analysis on this will be helpful both, both for you guys and for myself going forward. This, by the way, is guitar number four. To put that into perspective, I'm working on guitar number 57 right now. So on the one hand, it's cool to see for myself just how far I've gone. Uh, on the other hand, it, like I mentioned, is just... Ooh, it's a little cringy to look at some of these mistakes. So it's hard to know where to even begin here. We'll start by just pointing out this really obnoxious rosette here. I thought it would be cool to make a radial rosette that ran all the way to the edges of the hole. And one, the execution is poor. You can see these thick black gaps around the edges that I tried to fill with ebony dust. And it just really jumps out at you where the, where the bad fit is. For example, at these two points between these radial segments, you can see a really thick black line that really makes the poor workmanship stand out. Also, I didn't even really think that running this inlay all the, all the way to the edge doesn't really make it an inlay because on the end here, it's actually, you can see the end grain of the radial rosette and the end grain of the soundboard there. So when you see the edge of the sound hole, it actually looks like it's some sort of ply here because you see the two different layers of wood. And it just looks kind of shoddy. Also, it's just too much. It's too big and obnoxious of a rosette, which doesn't really pair well with other big obnoxious things on the guitar. If there were more obnoxious things on the guitar, it might look a little more fitting across the whole instrument. But it just jumps out at you as this sort of garish looking thing. Okay, moving on from that. I was trying to learn new techniques sort of all at once. Uh, this is the first guitar where I did a cutaway bend. First guitar where I did fretboard binding. Uh, first guitar that I did wood, bent wood binding instead of plastic. And so part of the problem with this guitar is there were a lot of things I was trying to do that were new at once. Basically, I bit off more than I could chew. And actually, if you watched my one video, 14 Mistakes, that new guitar builders make. I'm kind of paraphrasing my own title there a little bit. You'll see that one of the mistakes that a lot of people make is they bite off more than they can chew. They're trying to learn to do a cutaway instrument. They want binding on the fretboard, all these interesting and cool things that they see, like an arm bevel, which talk about biting off more than you can chew. Arm bevels are, are very difficult to execute. Well, I don't do them, but it's one of those pitfalls that new builders fall into and then you end up adding all these cool elements to your guitar but because you're executing them poorly it looks worse than if you just didn't try for that at all. So some other things uh, the bridge here is it's okay looking but really I over sanded around the 
edges and sort of took the edges off, and so the bridge as a whole looks kind of soft. There's no crispness to the transition points at the edges. And that's sort of a, a small thing, but it's something I notice now. Um, this, this is really big. This is a, a big design error, is the having the, the bend not meet up with the fretboard. One, it creates an awkward situation with your hand. You can feel that when you try to come up and play these notes up in the higher register. There's this pointy edge of the box right there. Not to mention, talk about poor execution there, that miter is terrible. In fact, all of the binding joinery around this area is just super gappy and very poorly done. So this whole area is just a, a mesh of design errors and execution errors. This is really ugly. Look at the, the black showing through on the bottom here. That's actually the fretboard. So I uh, bound the fretboard, glued it down to the neck blank, and then when I was carving the neck, I overcarved the neck, gave it almost too much of a sort of V shape. This is a very thin neck too. And so I actually sanded through the binding at the bottom edge because there's more contour as you get further away from this edge. And I sanded through it and revealed the fretboard underneath. So it just looks really horrific. Um, the heel actually looks pretty good. I actually did an okay job carving and blending in the heel with the neck shaft. So I won't be too hard on myself there. But then if we follow this back, it's a little gappy at the uh, joint between the neck and the body, particularly on this end over here by the heel cap. And also, uh, a really nice guitar typically has the plane of the back will run right onto the plane of the heel cap. And this heel cap is just a little bit proud of the body. So I don't know if you can really see it there in the camera, but I can definitely feel it and I can see it myself. Now another design error with this whole area here is that this is also just the wrong type of heel for a cutaway like this. Even though if you look at a lot of, you know, even reputable factory guitars will use this type of heel on a cutaway like this and just have this boxy edge sticking out. And that seems to be pretty largely accepted as a thing by buyers in the market. However, the wider Samaji style heel that actually meets the edge of the neck meets with the plane or the sweep of that cutaway curve. Now when you see that kind of heel and cutaway combo, then you realize what that part of the guitar is really supposed to look like. It's a much more sophisticated look. And let's take a look at this binding. Here's a very common execution error, which is to have this very inconsistent binding thickness going all the way around. In some areas, like right up here, it's nearly gone. There's less than a 64th of an inch of binding left in this spot. Then if you go to a really thick area, you can see there's a full 16th of an inch over here. Now this is an incredibly common problem. Some of you might be experiencing this issue with your guitars right now. Binding can be very difficult. The best way to remedy this problem is to always make sure your sides are very square and flat. Any sort of ripple in the side or small out of squareness as you come around about or something like that or go into the waist. Any small amount of out of squareness is going to translate into that binding channel because the bearing on your router bit is referencing right off the side. And it doesn't matter what system you're using for routing your bindings, you always run into that problem of whatever is referencing off of the side is translating the inconsistency of your sides into your binding channel. So the solution is to make sure your sides are meticulously square and flat. Uh, let's see what else. Um, the book match is actually done pretty well. If you look closely at the pores of the grain, you'll see this white stuff in the pores. That's from buffing with a white buffing compound and doing that on a finish 
where I didn't really fill the finish all the way up to the level of the pores. So that buffing compound gets caught in those pores and I found out the hard way that you can never really get it out. You might think scrubbing it with naphtha or something like that, you would eventually wash it out. Uh, it's, it's just kind of always in there. It really kind of ruins the, the look of the wood because you have these bright white specks all throughout. Now, a couple solutions for that. One, don't have unfilled pores. Use pore filler and make sure it fills all the way up before you start finishing. Or if you want to have pores, one thing you can do is buff with paste wax. Paste wax is clear, even if it does get caught in the pores, um, you're not gonna see it. Another thing you could do is use some sort of dyed buffing compound or dye the buffing compound yourself so that when it gets caught in the pores, it'll be a brown color or a black color or something like that, something that would look very natural in the pores. But this bright white color just doesn't look natural and so it jumps out at you. Huge mistake, and actually I'm ashamed to say that that's, this is not the only guitar that I've uh, made that same exact mistake on, so apparently I didn't learn anything from that. Though I don't do that now. The purfling here on the top, this is not how purfling is traditionally done. For some reason, and I don't even know or remember why, I chose to route the purfling right over top of the binding. So rather than having a step channel and having a binding strip uh, visible here in the top, then followed by the purfling, all you see is the purfling. And that, just like the back binding, is done very poorly and I've sanded through in certain areas. Um, down here on the side, it looks like I tried to patch in an area of missing purfling by using a black sharpie. Doesn't look good. Again, it's all because these sides weren't meticulously flat and square. Uh, let's see what else. The finish is, is pretty shoddy. I mean, here I just wore it out from playing it. But even aside from that, it's pretty shoddy all around, especially around the bridge and around the fretboard tongue. But that's something that's really difficult to master anyway. Although I don't make that mistake anymore now, but it took me a long time to try and get my finish skills to the point where you didn't have this very visible, poorly finished area right around the fretboard tongue and the bridge. Uh, if you follow my true oil finishing course, I can show you how I do that the correct way. If you look at the headstock, this headstock shape is kind of small and it transitions poorly into the taper of the fretboard. You can see there's almost no cheeks here on the headstock. And because the headstock was so small, I also had to alter my inlay design because it wouldn't even fit on such a small headstock. I had to remove, there's normally these two sort of wings that come off of the E and the S, and those would have run off the headstock. So I had to alter it, and it, it doesn't look as nice as my inlay normally looks. This is a big one. The fretboard tongue here is depressed. It goes down a little further than the plane of the fretboard does. Now there's a tiny bit of that that, you, that is desirable that you actually want, but you shouldn't be able to see it. It's such a small amount on the order of just a few or even just one thousandth of an inch. Just enough so that the each fret kind of falls away from the one in front of it. However, this is way too much fall away here. This is a result of shaping the fretboard completely, keep putting a radius on it, installing the frets and doing all that, and then gluing it down to the body. When you clamp it down to the body, it's always going to be clamped down just a little bit. So that's a big problem, and the remedy for that is to actually install the fretboard before you radius it and install the fret wire. That way, you can radius and level the fretboard in place the board, the wood itself, level that, then install the frets, and at that point you shouldn't even need a fret level. And even if you do give it a fret level, it only needs just a tiny bit of leveling to get it perfectly true, rather than the massive amount of leveling that you need when you install the fretboard pre-radiused. Uh, the fit here at the nut, there's a huge gap there, so that was poorly done.
Not sure why. Looks better on this side, but still I see a little gap up here in the front. That's no good. Oh, here's a fun one. The end wedge is upside down. There's no functional reason why the end wedge has to be one way or the other, but you never see a guitar like this, and for good reason, it just looks awkward. Traditionally, the end wedge is supposed to have the wider part up towards the soundboard, like it's opening up towards the soundboard. This is upside down, and it's pretty clearly off-center, and the fit is so bad that you can see how much I had to fill in the edge here to make up the difference. That wood looks pretty cool though. I don't know what that is. Anyway, good looking wood can't save you from all of these mistakes. This cutaway shape is lumpy looking, so that's poorly designed. It doesn't flow with the lines of the rest of the instrument. The miters here at the fretboard tongue are terrible. If you look at the saddle here, you can see that the fit is poor. The saddle is too small for this saddle slot, and it's actually leaning forward as a result. As far as the inside of the guitar, without really getting in there and, and actually taking a, a really deep look around, just looking through the sound hole here, I can see the back braces, not surprisingly, are very, very overbraced. It looks like what you would see on a typical factory, you know, $400 guitar where they slap on these super massive braces, which makes sense if you're selling guitars to be shipped around the world that are that have a warranty and that are intended to be used as hard, durable, gigging guitars. But for a fine acoustic guitar, you really want those braces to be slimmed way down from what I did on this guitar, and the sound of this guitar um, bears that out. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video every Friday. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.